Welcome everybody. Um, good evening. Welcome to Below the Ground Up. Um, a lot of you will know me already, but if you don't, I'm Tom Sykes. I'm a travel writer, um, a fan and occasional and occasional crit, sort of literary critic of science fiction, um, you might say. Um, I also teach creative writing at Portsmouth University, and I'm a proud member of the Tarticulation Group, which is bringing you this event tonight. And I've selected a background, especially um, for that. Uh, I think it's um, fair to say that this event is unique, and I don't use that word lightly. We were talking a little bit about this with my colleagues before, before kicking off, and um, I can't think of any event that's been, that I've attended or been involved in that's been quite like this. So I'm really looking forward to it. I hope you are too. I'm sure you are. Um, why is it unique? Well, it's really thanks to uh, the expertise of our special guests that you're going to hear from very, very soon. Um, they're going to talk about things fascinating, um, very novel stuff like um, planetary modelling, which is the uh, sort of imagining and designing of different geographical and geological terrains using uh, various tools, materials, platforms. Um, but we're also going to talk about the sorts of research um, such as traveling to some of the world's most extraordinary places that kind of feeds into and informs that, that work. Um, also how all of that sort of fits into writing about place in a kind of broad sense. We're also going to explore conjuring fictional worlds, science fictional worlds more specifically, and how writers can do that in a entertaining and consistent and believable way. So there's a, there's a, a lot of um, uh, exciting stuff coming up. So before I introduce our first guest speaker, I, I feel I should just give you an idea of what's roughly going to happen over this evening. Um, so Wendy, who I'll introduce in a moment, will speak for a bit first. Then David will speak. After that, my esteemed and learned colleague, Mandy Gary, will interview David and then bring Wendy in and ask her some questions. Then there'll be a chance for you, the audience, to ask them both questions. And then we will move to our spoken word section of the night. This is where you, members of the audience, will have an opportunity for, to read your own travel stories and pieces of writing related to place, whether these are fictional places or not or real places. Um, if you were going, if you were at our going on vocation event last week, you might have developed these stories out of prompts that I that I gave you during those exercises that we did towards the end. If you weren't at that event, that's absolutely fine. You can still perform your stuff. Um, but whichever category you belong to, could you please sign up? I've noticed a couple of you have done that already. That's fantastic. But sign up by typing your name in the chat box so that we, as the organisers, can get a sort of schedule together for when we, when we come to that. And I'll give you sort of more details about the spoken word bit when we get to the spoken word bit. I think that'll be easier rather than me going on too much at this early stage. So let me, without further ado, bring in Wendy Metcalf. Wendy is also as, very much a stalwart of the Tarticulation uh, group been um, there from the very beginning, and is a science fiction author. She says that she writes about big cats, sentient AIs, and feminist topics, and sometimes these themes all appear in the same character. Um, she has published the novels Panthera Death Song and Panthera Death Spiral. I th am I pronouncing that right, Panthera, Wendy? I tend to pronounce it Panthera, but I don't Panthera. know if there's any, yeah. Because I, I'm, when I when I saw the name, I was reminded of a band back in the '90s called Pantera, without an H. That I was a sort of metal band that I was quite into. Anyway, but um, I, it's, it's not pronounced like that. We know that. So, so two novels and also numerous short stories and uh, lots of articles related to kind of science fiction fandom and literature, but also. Um, Wendy writes about other issues, social, political, cultural, that, that interest her. She has an MA Merit in Creative Writing and has been teaching creative writing for over 10 years. And her, she can be found on Twitter at, at Wendy Metcalf one And I'll um, put that in the chat box in case people want to, to sort of start following her. And she also um, blogs, and I'll share the blog address rather than reading out some long address to you now. So um, welcome, Wendy. Um, Thank you. Over to you. 
All right. So David is going to talk about physically building 3D worlds, but I'm going to talk about how to translate those 3D worlds onto the 2D flat paper, which we are concerned with. Uh, as Tom has said, I'm a science fiction writer, so when I write a world, I have to start completely from so that's quite a lot of work involved in that. So what is involved in world building? Well, quite a lot of things. Um, first, physical geography, the obvious things. Where are the land masses, the rivers and the oceans on your world? Uh, and basically where the water is generally dictates where settlements are. People settle near rivers and near the coast. We obviously need water needed for drinking, but it's uh, in a lot of cases, also a primary transport system too. What climate zones are you writing about? Um, are your characters in temperate, tropical or Arctic air? What flora and fauna lives in that part of the year? If you're writing about the ocean, what ocean creatures are there too? If you're talking about the built environment in your story, what's the architecture like? Is it the same, all the same style or are there several different styles there? And how does the architecture reflect the history of that region? Obviously, if you're writing about Earth, you need to research these things about the area that you're writing in. Um, science fiction or fantasy writing, you have got to invent everything, but you borrow an awful lot of ideas from a for invented world. Um, we don't completely start off reinventing the wheel. Time period is something you need to fix. In a sense, that is your story set in the past. If it is, you're going to need to check historical details of your world. The buildings in somewhere in Victorian times or even further back are going to look very different from the buildings that are in a high street today, for example. If your story is set in the present, then obviously you can check the details on things like Google Earth and Google Maps and actually see what a place looks like. If your story is set in the future, then you're going to have to invent everything and it's down to you. Another thing that's part of storytelling, world building, is culture. How do people live in the world of your story or in the part of the world that your story is set in? Do they live in cities, in rural settlements, or are they totally isolated somewhere? What kinship and family systems are there in the world of your story? And are relationships based on some kind of sexual pairing? or on found family, or some kind of school. What kind of writing exists in your story world? Or are you writing about a time before writing existed? And what kind of visual arts exist, even if you are writing about very early people, you're likely to have some kind of possibly even rock art, if nothing else there. Uh, and things like dance, theatre, cinema, what kind of performance are, are in your world? And also, another thing which most cultures have in some form or other is music. What kind of music does your society have, or what forms of music? It might be very simple things from hollowed out uh, flutes or pipes from animal bones down to a full-blown orchestra if you're in the present day or the future. What's permitted and what's censored in the culture of your world? Who supports the art in their world, your story? Are there rich sponsors? Does the government support art or the military? How does this support restrict what art is made? Is that part of the way art is centered in that world? Moving on, something allied to that the political system or government of your story world. What kind of political system or government is present in your part of the world? Is it democracy? 
a dictatorship or communist ideology possibly, or it might be some kind of tribal leadership. Do political systems vary depending on which part of the world you're in? Is there conflict between different political systems in the same region? What kind of civil service is there in your story world? What kind of military is there? Is there a standing army or no organized military at all? And what trade alliances are present among the people of your story? An ally to trade, and obviously, elements of government and the military are the ideas of a legal system. Politics leads on, obviously, to a legal system. What kind of laws are there in your story world? Is it broadly a liberal place? Do the laws allow, for example, or is the world much stricter? What things are banned under that legal system? Are there any unusual laws in the region in which your story is set in? And do those laws reinforce a class or caste? system. Another thing to think about world building is technology and what level of technology do the people in your story use because even on earth some people live low tech lives uh, until recently there was one Amazonian tribe that had never been contacted by anyone outside. Uh, they didn't know anything at all about high tech. So there might be a variety of technology levels that your characters have. Do they live in an area with low tech? Mainly they're perhaps they're simple farmers and they don't have internet access. In a city with very high technology, is the technology that's there driven by war? An awful lot of technology over the years has been developed as a side effect of war. And are scientists in conflict with religious leaders, or do the two work together? What about wealth and a money system in the world of your story? How is wealth distributed? Are there rich and poor people in your story world? Is there a universal basic income there? Is hoarding wealth illegal? We can't imagine that, but there may actually be places where it would be. Allied to wealth is trading, because that's where most people make their money, of course. How do people trade in your story world? Is it locally in the market square? It might well be, and no further if they are farmers and don't travel out of their local area. Or if it's a very high tech world, perhaps they trade internationally like we do. Or perhaps if you're writing science fiction, it can be intergalactically too, very much between other worlds and even other species too. What's actually considered valuable? What do people want to trade? And what money system do they use to pay for the goods that they want to trade? Obviously, partly the level of technology of your people will dictate to a certain extent what's in demand. Because obviously, if your people don't use computers, they aren't going to be worried about trading silicon. Technology level obviously affects the logistics of trade. Uh, one of the science fiction writers I saw recently suggested asking, how far can perishable goods be transported in a day? which is quite an interesting metric, I think, to think of. Is there a black market for some goods, which actually the law ban, but people manage to get hold of anyway? And are traders monitored or controlled, or is there some kind of registration system for them? Let's look now about education. Who in your story world is entitled to education? Is there a favoured caste or class that gets the best education? Is everyone educated or does it depend on how much money you have? Does politics entitlement? Because for a long time we had a lot of enslaved people and still do in parts of the world. 
got little or no education. Is some education forbidden? Is education compulsory or does it have to be paid for, which again will limit which people get access to that education? And what's actually taught to our school? Who controls the curriculum? Does the government control it? Do the religion control it? What history is taught? I'm seeing a lot of discussion on Twitter from black authors round about now about the absence of black history being taught in English schools. Um, it's become quite a hot topic, obviously, and uh, that does make a difference to what you feel about history. What's left out? You know, British colonial history has usually left out black people's stories. We're only beginning to learn about them now. What about jobs and occupations in your story world? What do people do to earn money or to amass wealth? or even just to survive there? Do they have a free choice of what they do for a living? Or are they enslaved? And an example of this in the science fiction sphere is a book called Betty Chambers, A Closed and Common Orbit. There, there is a whole planet of cloned humans who are created just to work on production. And they're kept in line by robot overseers who give them shocks if they try and escape that sort of thing. So you can come across that quite often in science fiction stories. What kind of transport systems are there in the story world? This obviously is linked to the technology level of the region that you're at. And writer Jeanette King suggests asking, how far can people get in a day? And that's particularly relevant if you're writing history or fantasy, because obviously if you're riding a horse, there's a limit to how far the horse can get in a day before it collapses. Obviously, if you're writing science fiction and you have some flashy vehicle, you might be able to get a long way in the same time. What about agriculture and food and drink? What grows? in the area in which your story is set? How is it grown or transported? How much variety is there in food? Is it just subsistence rations or are there a full range of vegetables and luxury items? Are people self-sufficient on small holdings growing their own food or is agri agriculture high-tech, specialised and large-scale like it is in a lot of the UK now? What do people eat in animals? Or do they eat only a plant-based diet? Or, as another idea that Becky Chambers has in her book, people eat bugs. There are bug fries. And so sometimes people would have bug bones in order to create those bugs for food. What about the ideology? of the regional world that you're setting the story in. Is whatever passes for a government there corrupt? Are the people in that region at war? And who are they at war with and why? And what things are considered crimes in that region or the world that you're writing about? And that leads on to considering religions too. What religions exist in the world? Are they monotheistic, in other words, worship one god, or polytheistic, worshipping many gods like the Romans did? How powerful are religions? What is the religion's view of the world? Are people sinful? How does the religion define evil? Because that will also feed back into what the law says too. How does the religion define sex? Is sex seen as an evil thing or something to be celebrated? And are people free to believe in the religions of that area or not? How do people worship? Do they pray? Do they have dire symbols? Do they have grand festivals celebrating their gods? 
Um, and if you're writing fantasy, related to that is the question of magic and fantasy world. You need to ask who wields it, who is it committed to, and actually how much power do magic users have? Let's take a slight side step now and talk about fashion. What fashions do people wear in your story world? Does clothing show group, religious, class, or political affiliations? And in another book that's a favourite of mine by Arcady Martin, it's a book called A Memory Called Empire. It's a very elaborate empire which has court dress where departmental affiliation is denoted by different colours of jacket sleeves. Who's permitted to have what jobs in the world of your story? That's obviously law. And what barriers are there to certain jobs? Professional associations might bar certain people. Women, possibly gay people. And what about leisure in the world of your story? What sports do people play there? Solitary or team sports? What social groups are committed? And which are banned in that world? Do you have any leisure time? If they're living a subsistence life, farming from dawn to dusk, they probably don't have any energy for a social life. Do people get any holidays? Do people spend leisure time alone or with groups of people? So that's an awful lot of things to think about when you're creating a story world. And obviously you're not going to use all of that. I see world building a bit like an iceberg. Only the relevant details are going to appear above the water and in your... So the, the top of the iceberg. And what's relevant and what you write about will depend on the type of story you're writing. All other things will be submerged. You won't be writing about them. But knowing most of this stuff gives your story more depth and authority, even if it's not. You wave your story. For crime writers, right, can you still hear me? Yeah, good, sorry, he's telling me my internet to the stable. I was hoping it wouldn't do that. Um, yeah, crime writers, the perennial problem is stopping characters being able to call for help by taking out their mobiles. And one way of doing this is often having characters in a remote place where there's no signal. So that drives your choice of location for the story. You can also use your world to reinforce the mood of the story you're telling. Showing a character walking along the busy sunlit summer beach is going to have a very different story mood to a story showing a character descending into a dark cave. You might use a storm to threaten your characters or a heat wave. And the culture of the area that your story is set in might cause problems for your characters. If they're outsiders, they might encounter unfriendly locals so how to bring your story alive? Well, first of all, don't put a straight info dump description of your world on To see and describe the setting through the eyes of your viewpoint character. And seeing the world through their eyes allows you to add their emotional reaction to the place. Today, I've actually been writing about a new character who just turned off on this massive shipyard she's never seen before and she's very overwhelmed with it so I've managed to meet get her emotional reaction to that in with the description of the actual physical setting. Does your character actually love or hate the place that they find themselves in and why do they feel that way about it? Using an outsider to describe a place is a good technique if you can do. The idea of the innocent fraud who knows nothing about the place they're in because they notice details that the locals don't. And again, in Arcady Martin, the memory called Empire, 
she does that wonderfully with her description of this vast, sprawling, textile-only city. And showing setting through your character's eyes allows you to narrow down the description to the parts which you actually need for the story. And it also helps you to use all the senses in that description because your character's hearing something, they're smelling something, they might be touching something. What food are they eating? Are they tasting? And it also allows you to get the focus right. Where is your character focusing their attention? Are they focused on street level happenings or citywide happenings or on a planetary scale? If you're inventing a place from scratch, draw a map of it. It really helps get the details right and helps with working out travel times. And that's not just the science fiction writers. My friend Carol Weston has written a cozy crime novel, which she's just been revising. And she realised that she needed a map of this small little retirement estate that all her characters live on. So she sat down to, to draw a map of where all the various bungalows were on the estate. So I think that's probably enough information being thrown at you from me. I hope I've given you some successful pointers to think about when writing your next story. And to all you writers out there, good luck with your writing and creating vibrant story worlds. Thank you so much, Wendy. That was uh, brilliant and very comprehensive. I think all those sorts of questions that you posed about what goes into a world or a society. I, I, you know, when you think about it, I, I was just thinking myself of the sort of physical aspects of the landscape, but you're absolutely right to talk about ideology and education and people's jobs, fashion. So really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Very, as I say, very comprehensive, very, very rounded. Um, we will now um, go over to our second speaker uh, this evening. David Angus is an expert on world geologies, traveling to locations to explore unusual features in the landscape and beneath. He uses this to inform not only his planetary model making, um, which is, um, I think, a fascinating activity. And I think David may be the only practitioner of it in the world, really. And, and, and he'll obviously go on and explain what that actually is and, and, and why it's important. And um, his achievements in it. Um, so he's he's a he's a model maker, and he'll talk to you about that. But he's also a writer. Um, he's done a lot of travel writing and a lot of uh, sort of uh, kind of writing that Wendy was talking about. Really, sort of he's very interested in science fiction. I know that, and he's written um, about he's sort of invented worlds and and uh, terrains as well in his writing. Um, when it comes to researching planetary landscapes and knowing how far down you go before reaching the gates of hell, David is your man. Um, in, these, in this sort of capacity as a planetary modeler, um, David has worked with the BBC amongst other major organizations. No doubt he will, or he may talk about that shortly. And his travel writing can be found at uh, Star and Crescent, which is a, a website that I'm one of the founders of. And I'll, I'll link to that so that you can, you know, I really thoroughly recommend David. He's been writing for us for about, we worked it out just before um, the start of this event, five years now, pretty much since we started the website. And you can see his stories about going to Chernobyl, going to Viet caves in Vietnam, his thoughts on things like Brexit and the whole range of subjects. So I thoroughly recommend that. Um, so I will hand over to you, David, if you're ready to go. It looks like you've got your slides up. So yeah, I am. Um, I'm, I'm ready to go. Ah, here we go. All right. Well, if I'm supposed to know how far down the gates of hell are, Perhaps I'd better start with this photo, which contains a bat at the bottom of an 80 meter climb. I just descended in rock climbing gear for the first time in my life at 66. You are now in the world's biggest known cave, which one could fly a jet airliner through parts of since its ceiling is 150 meters or more in height. 
a Sondung cave, Vietnam. Some of the surroundings resembled those Dura illustrations of Dante's hell with, without the sinners. By the way, the deepest known cave is Veriokina Cave, Caucasus Mountains, which is 2,212 meters deep, part of a massif riddled with deep caves. Now, is that an infestation of bugs in a hole? No, it's a campsite revealing the scale of Sondun Cave at Watch Out for Dinosaurs. When I came across that name for this place during internet research, all right, surfing, it was like rocket fuel to the boy within me who'd refused to grow up and had long ago seen that film with James Mason and the Dimetrodons, Journey to the Center of the Earth. Now here was this enormous cavern that could virtually swallow Ports Downhill, housed stalagmites as high as office blocks, was actually big enough for clouds, and even had a primeval jungle fit for prehistoric monsters because the roof had fallen in, in, in two places, known as dough lines, I believe. It was a chance to experience journey to the center of the earth for real. But could I do it as 66 on blood pressure tablets during a tropical summer? Well, these photos are proof that I made it. There are actually two enormous caves for the price of one. In between, there really is a loss of valley because one can only get to it through caves. When I took this photo, it was as though I wandered into a comic strip with a distant explorer sprouting speech balloons along the lines of, so it really does exist. The legend said there are dinosaurs here. Ends of a head of one amidst jungle stage right. It was such a stage for dinosaurs, I was looking over my shoulder for that Brachiosaurus coming round the corner and nibbling the tree behind me. There is a practical reason for this photograph though. It shows the nature of the terrain. Regions of old Devonian Carboniferous limestone deposited long before the dinosaurs are strewn from China down through Southeast Asia to the East Indies. It erodes into the most jagged, tough country and caves smothered in jungle. Much might remain hidden here. Sondun Cave was lost after it was found and rediscovered by a British expedition. That's why I think there just might be a bigger cave out there. James Mason and company escaped from the center of the earth by being shot up through an erupting volcano. Absurd, I know, but let's suppose. Our volcano seen here seems to have deposited us in the Precambrian, what with the basalt coastline and barren landscape. Even the sky is turquoise, indicating an atmosphere of Precambrian difference. In reality, it's Lanzarote, which has so many small volcanoes, it looks as though it's caught smallpox when viewed from the plain above. Also, this photo needed a major salvage operation on Adobe Photoshop, which happened to produce a turquoise sky. I decided to leave the sky because for all I know, the atmosphere might have had that hue when its composition was different. Before there was anything as advanced as a trilobite in the sea and an oxygen atmosphere was a relatively recent concept. Anyone able to shed light on this? Now, hang on a minute, ah, there we are. Since we're time traveling, let's move forward to the Cambrian period itself. I thought the Inselberg of Uluru, or Ayers Rock as it was known, was igneous. Wrong. When I was exploring Australia's red centre, I learned that it's actually formed from Cambrian sedimentary rock. A travel writing description could include parts of this surface being holed and pitted for some geological reason, looking like the decomposing skin of an immense corpse. Other nearby notable landforms are also Cambrian sedimentary like Catachuta, was known as the Olgas, gigantic rounded rock masses high as Dartmoor, where the rock is conglomerate, and also a mesa of Mount Connor, where the rock is fine sediment. It seems floods and outflows on a, from a Cambrian mountain range sorted and graded the sediment. The remains of primeval Australian mountain ranges can look like gigantic wheel ruts from the air. Now, let's time travel for onwards to that time most children 
and some overgrown children like me love, the time of the dinosaurs. This photo shows that geology related matters affecting landscape and what could be found there can be of interest to travel writing, even when it's as close as the other side of the Isle of Wight. This rock is an iguanodon footprint, which can be seen there. A footprint from an animal about the size of a double decker bus. Its weight compressed what was then mud, so its form lasted through 120 million years. Whole outcrops of them can be found along the beach here. Those outcrops exist because there were wildebeest-like herds of iguanodons back then in the Lower Cretaceous period. As this model of a region then shows with its completely different geography, present day coastlines being superimposed. The iguanodon migrations are shown as a west green, uh, sorry, west east green dotted line. The migrations of Brachiosaurus II, also found on the Isle of Wight, can be seen as a red north south dotted line. My model shows how planet building or part of it can help travel or descriptive writing, making it easier to imagine a world of monster migrations across arid floodplains or steaming swamps as, with research, one can find evidence of contrasting climate conditions, such as wet and dry seasons at this time. Another geology related scene influencing travel writing close to home the chalk downs of Northern Hampshire and Berkshire. From a later time in the Cretaceous and the time of the Iguanodons, when the chalk was formed over what is now England in a sea, when the world's oceans rose 300 meters. This time forming a landscape of beautiful views I strolled through when completing a sponsored summer hike for a special needs school. There was a breeze along the top of these hills that took the edge off the heat and no discomfort after days of it felt unreal. Then there were all those white clouds looking idealized and almost regular, almost as though the school children had painted them. Had I expired into some sort of heaven for someone who walks for a special needs school? That would explain the kiddie clouds and total lack of discomfort. The sky too seemed a deeper blue than normal. So was I, on the other hand, on another planet that looked remarkably like England. Last stop on our time traveling, an early Cenozoic lake system in what is now Utah deposited the latter part of what would become known as Bryce Canyon. A process started back in the Cretaceous when the deposition was in a continent spanning sea. The people you can see at the bottom of the image descending into the canyon give the right kind of scale to the millions of years needed to do this across the Mesozoic and Cenozoic eras. When I saw this though, I felt like bursting out laughing because it was as though some mad artist had dismembered the cathedrals of Europe, somehow got them across to the States, shoved them frenetically into an escarpment and spray blasted them pink and orange too. That's the way it seemed to me as a travel writer. Back to the present, well, more or less, or a parallel world with something in common with Middle Earth, perhaps, where the medieval culture compared to our own is too recent to count geologically. I was hiking up a Norwegian valley where there was one waterfall after another. The one seen here is just an average Norwegian waterfall. But how would you like this at the bottom of your back garden? It was almost like walking through a fairy tale, like Middle Earth. Then I realized where I was, Rivendell, where there are all those waterfalls or the misty mountains near there. I'd explain my sponsored hikes to a head teacher as being my ambition to wind up like Gandalf, to be capable of hacking it across the misty mountains with my trusty staff at two miles an hour, despite being ancient, and now I was achieving that. And this sense of wonder was inspired in just one of the many valleys fashioned from a mountain range and aeon old that had been worn down and uplifted again on what is only a small part of planet Earth. There's so much to see out there. Another waterfall with the minute scale of man compared to it. 
Niagara Falls started at the end of the last ice age when an enormous amount of water melting from the ice sheet formed the Great Lakes and the Niagara River, creating the falls over an escarpment stretching through the region. It's eroded back through a layer of dolomite at the rate of roughly a foot a year since then. Niagara Falls is 58 meters high, but Victoria Falls, which I've also seen, is nearly twice that. I find the scale of nature and geological time comforting, because if human beings are insignificant compared to this, then our problems shrink accordingly. That's why I feel getting immersed in soap operas and so-called reality TV is like looking at life through the wrong end of a telescope. Contorted strata on the Greek island of Skyros. Along with a holiday cruise full of boozing, swimming and sunbathing, there's still time to bag a few memorable photos at leisure of the natural world. And parts of the Skyros coast such as this are absolutely spectacular in revealing the geological forces needed to produce its effect on strata and build a mountain range. Greece and its islands are full of mountains and Skyros is actually composed of two different geological systems where even the vegetation is different. The north is a rocky, well-wooded land of broken hills. The south consists of relatively barren, rounded hills and mountains. The grave of Rupert Brook, the famous word First World War poet, is also there in an olive grove. Mm, quick swig. Ah. I guess my interest in physical geography, including geology and how it affects the landscape, which is geomorphology, really developed during A-level geography at grammar school sixth form. One of the things we were taught about was intrusive volcanism, such as when magma forces its way up a vertical fissure, solidifies and eventually erodes differently. Well, now and then amidst one's travels, one comes across a textbook example of something one learned at school, and here is one. A dike exposed in a road cutting on Gomera, one of the Canary Islands. I've seen one looking like a man-made wall going up the vertical side of a gorge on the same island, leading one thinking, how on earth did they build that? And what for? Unless one has the right of education. Remember Devil's Tower in Close Encounters of a Third Kind? Well, imagine a mountain range of the same geology, and here it is, the Hogar Mountains in the middle of the Sahara Desert. The Devil's Tower, Wyoming, and these mountains are volcanic plugs of column of basalt. The Sahara Desert is as big as a respectable continent in itself and has room not just for seas of dunes the size of our chalk hills, but all kinds of stark landscapes, including this one, which looked like something designed by malevolent alien architects or some colossal silicon life form sprouting from underground. Plenty of scope in the Sahara for one's imagination regarding travel writing or science fiction. Speaking of which, I've seen another place which looked just like that Russian image they managed to get at the surface of Venus apart from an oxygen nitrogen atmosphere of blue skies instead of a hellish one of sulfurous clouds time to leave earth and get into planet building now i haven't actually been to mars but this photo suggests i might have taken it there the truth is the photo taken in lanzarote had degraded into a pink sky so one didn't have to do much on adobe photoshop and these remains of volcanoes calderas look so much like impact craters Pink sky, impact craters, and a field of rocks. You can't get much more Martian than that. Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles was filmed on this island along with parts of 1 million years BC. Travel writing can include how weird a landscape is, how it might remind one of another planet or time, or just something not experienced until seeing it. The Canary Islands are ideal for this, for they're full of inspirational geological landscapes and easy to get to. That's why there are a large number of them on this talk. I've been to Mars in spirit, both present day Mars and thousands of years into the future to terraform Mars. 
I don't believe one could do it in a few hundred years, but it might be possible long term if we get our act together and conserve planet Earth properly in order to keep our civilization going, apart from it being a beautiful world. That will mean adapting commerce instead of obeying its dogma and getting rid of certain political idiocies. If one works intensely producing a model of a planet as I have, one can learn much about the world and sometimes it almost feels as though one's there. This model shows what terraformed Mars might look like in the regions of Certis Major and Hellas. It was produced for the Adler Planetarium Chicago. Further out now in this solar system, Io, one of the big four Galilean moons of Jupiter where the sun's light is not as strong as here. I've tried to simulate that for this image on Photoshop, which is of a mountain picked out by satellite imagery on Io, the most volcanically active body in the solar system. Absence of material on the Black Lake indicates that it was volcanically active, but everything might have changed by now since tidal stresses condemn Io to constant volcanic turmoil. Imagine the fun one might have trouble writing alien landforms. The modeling of these landforms is my work, but the painting and display work of this part of this model of part of Io was that of Rick Sternbach, best known for his extensive work on Star Trek episodes and movies. Last photo from the Canaries, I promise. Get rid of the sky on this one, it could be Io, instead of Montana's Del Fuego, Mountains of Fire, on Lanzarote with the yellow lichen being sulfur deposits. Tint the sky orange or light brown and it might be Titan, which I've also modelled, with a lichen being methane frost instead, perhaps. There are parts of planet Earth where one could get an insight into what other worlds or moons might be like. These worlds could be orbiting other stars if one extrapolates geography, climate and natural history, which I tend to do in planet building. So many exoplanets have been found out there orbiting other stars and are being found all the time. Some of them are similar in size to Earth. It's such a numbers game with big numbers that some must be Earth-like insofar as possessing oceans and land masses and perhaps life. Now imagine the planet I've modeled above is the first alien exo-Earth discovered in detail. Very Earth-like in some ways, with even a hurricane I've photoshopped in, but with totally alien geography and life. There are many islands on this world studying the oceans, so it could be a volcanically active moon of a gas giant. Earth-sized moons are perfectly feasible for planets the size of Neptune upwards, since our moon is disproportionately big for the size of our planet. Now imagine this, as being the next exo-Earth reached by our exploration spaceship, robot probe or whatever. One can be inspired by what is already written and I love the concept of a world consisting of subtropical coastline which was referred to as being the home of Megadodo publications in his Shaka's Guide to the Galaxy. I haven't gone as far as spaghetti-like landforms everywhere but there are planet-wide equatorial oceans generating warm ocean currents reaching as far as the poles, leading to widespread subtropical regions. Pretty much what our world was like back when our friends, the dinosaurs were around, in fact, and that was brought about by the disposition of land masses at that time. Paleogeography can be an inspiration for imagining alternative Earth-like alien worlds, but that has been the changing nature of our world through time. Whew. Mm. that's it folks <sighs> thank you so much david that was uh tremendous um you took us on a kind of whistle stop tour of this world and others um you did really well i thought to bring together our two main themes science fiction and travel writing um uh, on, on several occasions so um, what i'm going to do now is i'm going to introduce my colleague mandy gary um another member stalwart of Tarticulation, um, who is going to ask 
David some questions and then we'll bring Wendy into the discussion and then we'll sort of open it out to everyone else. You're on mute, Andy, I think. Thank, thanks, Tom, and thanks to David. I mean, what, what an incredible gallop through your worlds, um, David, and we can see that um, there are many of them and of all sorts. I, when I was watching those slides and hearing you talk, I could imagine that the moving on of time might work differently in some of those locations. And that um, really made me think about the, the sort of stories you could create um, from that premise, really, whether it be speculative fiction or historical or all sorts of other things, of course, that you actually refer to. You said early on in the, in the talk that it was literature that piqued your interest. You talk, talked about um, lost worlds and, and those sorts of things. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about that and how soon as a boy you knew that you really were interested in this sort of thing. I mean, both geology, but perhaps science fiction too. Well, memory is almost like fossils and I've, I've started to write an autobiography. I've gone way back into childhood infancy. And when I was six years old, uh, a babysitter gave me a model of a stegosaurus, which has remained my, my favorite dinosaur. And I, I phoned her up um, once saying, you started the whole thing off. And she said, no, I didn't, because you were already interested in things like that. So I don't really know how far back it goes, but. Other things I did as a kid was buy comics. And there were comic versions of classics and Journeys of the Center of the Earth was one of them. Then there were the uh, films like um, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Journey to the Center of the Earth, certainly. Uh, that really did something for, for me, yeah. So that's Brilliant. more or less the answer. Go on. Thank you. Now, I've actually read some of your work on Star and Crescent, and I'm going to go back to read much more because Tom has um, told me that there is much more for me to read there. But, and I certainly recommend that, that others do that. I think you have a, um, a really good way with words and you pull us in to your worlds Thank um, you. through your writing. In one of those, you talk about being roped up um, possibly it's the um, descent into um, the cave in Vietnam, and but about being roped up and not knowing if you'd manage to reascend. Yeah. You can tell the audience then what that was like for you, and and perhaps talk us through some of the processes too. Well, I had no previous experience of uh, rock climbing, although I practice indoor climbing because I knew the, the terrain was going to be pretty rough, but I, I thought the being roped up was going to be some sort of health and safety feature. But um, it became apparent that, oh no, I was, I was in for the real thing, lowering myself over the edge of a black abyss. You know? <laughs> and and um, that was one of the most fantastic times in my, my, my life because I felt, you know, I, I couldn't afford to think about it for, for too long. The process seemed, seemed simple enough, so I thought, right, get stuck in, you know, and just do it. Um, and I got on reasonably well with, with that, efficiently at least. It wasn't actually a sheer drop, it was an 80 degree slope, which could still kill you. But, you know, I was, I was on a line and everything, and I could back, you know, walk backwards down it. Um, then there was coming out again. Now, halfway up, there was an easy traverse along a, a rock shelf. And um, when we got to the bottom going up, I asked the, the, the guide, who's going up first? And, and, and the response was, you are. <laughs> Great. So gung-ho, up we go, you know. Um, and uh, got, got to halfway mark. Now, there was a bit of an overhang starting the next one up. And uh, that was one, one, one hell of a challenge beyond that because failure is, is, is not an option. And I couldn't go over, over, this, over this overhang. So eventually I heard a sound of running feet behind me. 
and I got kick-started by hands being thrust onto my bum and just shoved up over this overhang, and uh, away I went. Um, and I, I, I made it. You know, I, I got out of there, and um, and after, after the whole thing was over, um, I said, "Well, I did all right." To one of the guys, and the response was, "You did good." <laughs> You know, so that was that was a judgment on that one. I'm very pleased that um, we've got you here as as proof itself that you did all right and you and you got back. You survived that situation. But I wonder how often the thought of an adrenaline rush motivates you, or is it sheer bloody mindedness that makes you take on a challenge? Well, what what motivates me most of all is love of the world's wild places. Uh, going on um, an adventure. Also being, being a science fiction fan, uh, some of my favorite science fiction stories are those involving journeys. I'd like to be, to feel that I've got really what, what it takes, even if I'm as old as Gandalf, to, to basically hack it as, as far as the journey goes. Uh, now fighting would, would, would be something else entirely. You know, I'm not at all confident about that, but at least I can get halfway there, you know, in reality with, with, with the journey. Um, I was gonna say something else, but I've forgotten and uh, a girlfriend has told me I, I must have waffled during this, so I'll, <laughs> I'll be guided by her. Well, I'm, I'm going to mention the fact that you seem to really like and choose unusual places to go. And I know that one of them that Tom alluded to earlier was Chernobyl. It's uh -huh. not everybody's holiday destination, I have to say. Right. So can you tell us why you wanted to go there and also what it was like? Well, it, it was science fiction for real. Um, it was only 70 miles from Kiev, where, where we were. Uh, which in terms of uh, Russian distances or U Ukrainian is actually quite small. You know, that's about as far as London is from, from Portsmouth, but the roads aren't nearly as uh, crowded. You know, it's, it's relatively simple drive. Uh, Chernobyl um, was a science fiction disaster scenario for, for real, but I love unique uh, experiences. It's one reason I, I like traveling. I'm motivated by the natural world, but it's true, I get an adrenaline rush to going um, by uh, involving going to new places, going through adventures like that cave, also Komodo dragons. Um, I had adventures with, with them also. Um, and um, Chernobyl too, you were in um, some degree of uh, uh, potential danger. And out of the people I was with, there was a small group, but I was the most cautious one. I believe in doing my uh, homework before any hazardous uh, um, venture, so you can minimise the uh, risk. Really. That's really interesting. Thank you. Mm. Now, going on then to your planetary models, I believe that you have them exhibited in all sorts of different places. And you mentioned one of them earlier. But can you tell us a little bit more about that? And are there any that we could go and see in situ once we're allowed out again? Well, the one, uh, the, I mean, I've got models here. I've got a small model of Mars, which has actually been used uh, filming. Anybody is quite welcome to visit me and see them. I've held art shows in them. The next one out, um, is um, just on the other side of the Isle of Wight of the Dinosaur Iron Museum. And that is the globe you see behind me, Lower Cretaceous Earth. Um, the Adler Planetarium is, um, I mean, they, that's, that's a, a lot further, but if anybody's in the USA and um, in Chicago, they might try to find it there. Oh, there's also, before I forget, the biggest one I ever made, present day Earth, 42 inches in diameter, that's in the Royal Geographical Society London. And that was a very proud moment for, for me because my heroes were the Victorian explorers and believe it or not, I actually made it, you know, as, a, and as part of the in, in, institution, you know, I'd actually got a foothold there. Anyway, I'm uh, waffling again. 
I don't I don't think you are David it's all, all right. very very interesting and and what a fantastic thing to to do and to have your your um, items placed in such prestigious places I think that's a mark of of the um, worth of what you're doing but finally David because I'm conscious of the time this evening yeah. finally oh, it's really well when you're having fun <laughs> yes indeed so when travel becomes viable again how would you recommend people find their own new adventures and where will you be heading um well adventures you, you can have adventures almost anywhere um if you do things in an unusual way perhaps i um, uh, since I don't drive a car, I, I walk, you know, and I, I was walking out uh, just along the Kennet and Avon Canal outside Reading. And believe it or not, I came across a field of dinosaurs. These are model ones, you know, life size. Somebody had parked them in, in the corner of this field. No idea why, what the story was or whatever. So you can see a surprising amount on foot just to, if, if you're walking locally. Um, I had a trip planned to... Nepal, I was going to stay in a beautiful converted fort with a grandstand view of the Himalayas, but along came COVID. And also wanted to go to um, Arthur Kanadar's Lost World, climb Mount Roraima. Now, those two, hill walking in Nepal and climbing Mount Roraima are fairly strenuous. Um, and I felt that, well, if I can get those two under my belt, then if I go anywhere after that, they can send me to where all the infirm old drunks hang out, <laughs> which would be science fiction dimensions, you know, which I also like. Thank you, David. Thank you very much um, for sharing all of this with us this evening. I'm going to move across to, to Wendy just briefly then, just to ask her a, a couple of questions also. Um, Wendy, I'm very conscious that as a, as a teenager in the late 60s, I was reading Asimov. And I was considered a little odd for doing that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I don't think there were any female science fiction writers at the time. So I'm going to ask you two things here. One is, were you reading science fiction early on? And um, are there many, many more female science fiction writers now, of which of course you are one? Well, um, sorry. I started off, I guess, getting hooked into science fiction um, by writers like Anne McCaffrey, I guess, back early in ooh, 1980s. Um, there's quite a lot of trying to think about all the other books I read at the time. A lot of books. A lot, there's always been a lot of women science fiction writers in science fiction. The problem is that a lot of them have been erased over the years. But I actually have on my bookshelves behind me quite a lot of old work by writers, women science fiction writers that were around in the 70s, 80s when I started to read that kind of thing. Uh, Vonda McIntyre's Dream Snake, um, The Snow Queen, Joan D. Vinge, that was a huge series there. T.J. Cherry, Carolyn Cherry has been writing for decades too. One of my favourite books that goes back to 1980, The Pride of Chinur. The main characters are not, they're not human at all, they're alien big cats, but they are very, very richly drawn. Uh, Ursula Le Guin, of course, has been around for ages, um, particularly classics like The Left Hand of Darkness, which is all British book. Um, so, yes, I got hooked in to, I got hooked into science fiction by reading women science fiction authors, and most of those I found by a Lambeth library when I was commuting to London to my job in the early 20s there. Uh, authors like Catherine Kerr, Polar City Blues, those kind of books I wouldn't have come up, up against if they weren't in the library at the time. Perhaps we ought to ask you to um, create us a reading list. That might be quite interesting. That would be that would be a lot to look. And of course, we have lots of new authors coming in. Um, quite a lot of award winners in the series too. A lot of 
Hugo Award winners, one of the big awards, um, N.K. Jemisin, uh, a woman of colour who got the best novel award three years in a person who's ever done that. There's uh, a, a writer called Lady Okorafor, who has a wonderful series of novellas Binti novellas, they're called, which are beautifully, richly um, in her own, set in her own culture. And I really absolutely love those. Uh, there are, I mentioned Arcady Martin, who is a relatively new writer now. That's a very intricate story about a great empire, and it's all full of diplomatic machinations with a little science fiction twist to um, Anne Leckie. She was an award winner. And that's very much, that's quite a hard science fiction thing with um, spaceship controlling ancillary bodies. And it's about another massive empire there. So those are just a few of the authors I can think of off the top of my head. Thank you, that, that's fantastic. Now, it has been said that all fiction comes from the time that it is written, no matter when it's set. Um, do you recognise that in your own writing? And if it's so, then has the focus of your writing changed as the world we live in has changed? Yes, very much so. Um, the story I am working on now, the novel, the original manuscript of that novel, I think it's about 30 plus years old and it is, it's obsolete now because I can't use the premise I did there because real life has actually caught up with it and overtaken it. And also when I went back and looked at it, all the characters were white and nobody had any disabilities, nobody had anything else, any kind of diversity at all. So that was one of the things that was really quite startling when I went back to it. So I'm now rewriting it now and I'm very conscious of those and trying to change it. In fact, I've changed some of the major characters from very white characters to actually very black characters. So that sort of thing. And I've got another character who has a physical disability. That was there before, but I didn't actually point it up very much in the manuscript, but I'm going to make more of that too. So yes, very much, because that is a discussion that's going on for real in the science fiction community now. And there are an awful lot of other writers from different kinds of backgrounds who are coming into science fiction now. So they're making their own cultures and their own views known. Aliette de Beaudard, a Vietnamese descent quite a lot of African writers. So yes, it's very definitely different now. Thank you very much, Wendy. I'm actually going to pass everyone back to Tom now, um, who's I think going to open things up for us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mandy and, and Dave and Wendy for, for a great discussion um, following on from your, your talks. Um, yes, so now we come to the, the spoken word element of the uh, night i was worried that we'd be lacking in volunteers but that worry was misplaced because i'm very pleased that um we have several volunteers um i've put them in put you in order of when you signed up which seems only fair um mark isles ailes isles how do i pronounce your name sorry i don't want to get that wrong isles isles okay good <laughs> You, I believe that you were in touch with Mandy sort of beforehand, and <laughs> therefore we feel that you should be top there. Um, you know, I'm trying to be fair about these things yeah. and the order that they run. Um, and then I've got, correct me if I've missed anyone, um, Jonathan Evans, Suzanne Perrick, David Hyam, Habib, sorry, I don't have your surname or other, another name, and David Gates. So we'll go in that order. Is there anyone I've missed um, that signed up? I've tried to scroll through the chat box and I think I, that should be everyone. Um, we may have other contributions from Tarticulation regulars. We'll see how the time goes. Um, 
I, I know these are all sort of short pieces, which is good. Um, do we, Mandy, do, do we have a sort of time limit? I mean, we say sort of maximum five minutes or something? Oh, per person, or? I think that would work very well, yes. Yeah, so I'll try and keep time. I, I'll try not to be rude and tell anyone to shut up or anything like that. That would be inappropriate. But I might just um, politely mention it if you are going on long so if you can try and sort of keep to keep to five minutes each that would be great and and mark if you'd like to kick off okay this is um this is three characters encountering the same uh location on an alien moon and it's from a science fiction book i'm in the middle of writing so and it's from the point of view of three different different well three different points of view it starts off from the point of view of a drone a dark chamber the drone lights and infrared started picking out shapes. Coils of tangled tubing heaped on the chamber's polished floor, the chamber bigger than the cave it had just passed through. It soared high overhead, looked like the rock had been hollowed out by a pile of soap bubbles long since burst. The drone's eye view flared white as something lit up, the lens diaphragm irised in. The piles of tubing were now pulsing different shades of blue and purple. A sighing sound filled the chamber, rapidly increasing in volume. No movement amongst the tubes. The drone moved forward until it was passing under arches of coils through hose-walled passages. So now we've got the point of view of a researcher whose name is Sift. Sift paused, squatting, and scanned the chamber. At least 100 metres high in the centre, double that across, roughly hemispherical. The violet blue coiled structures were glowing more intensely, gleams glowing, uh, rolling through the strand work converging on knots, making them pulse as they arrived concurrently. As she watched, new colours joined the light play, the bright motes accelerating. Sift slowly stood, watching for any discernible reaction in the alien technology. Impossible to see any specific response, the whole chamber was alight in an incandescent rainbow. The floor was mirror smooth, reflecting the coiled light tubes. Her tech was sorting through the data being fed from her suit sensors, small pop-ups flashing reports on inputs from a wide swathe of the electromagnetic spectrum. The room was not just alive in the visual spectrum, but a cacophony in all the wavelengths her suit could monitor. Radiation meters and pressure sensors oscillated. Overlying the light show, a loud sighing, sounding uncannily like some creature breathing, some creature awakening. And now we've got the, the, uh, another character, um, the investigator, whose name is Chikani. The alien technology was so much bigger and brighter than Chikani had been expecting. The sense of scale did not come over in the pictures she'd seen. The mess of tubes was much more vivid than she had in, anticipated. They shone in spectacular coruscations. This was not the ancient machinery that Chikani had thought to find here. She walked forward and placed her naked hand on one of the larger tubes and concentric rings of primary colours radiated from where she touched. Chikani put her other hand on the alien tubing. The flickering lights gently cycled through colours as though secret codes were being transmitted in the constellations that ran along their lengths. Okay, and that's the end. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mark. Very atmospheric. Excellent. Um, sorry, Mandy, I just realised that we've possibly missed something with the people giving people the opportunity to ask questions of Dave and Wendy, but maybe we'll come back to that after the spoken word section if people do have, and we can just have a general Q&A. Okay. I think that's a good idea. Good, good. Okay. Okay, so Jonathan Evans, if you're... Right, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. This builds on the session that we did last week, and this is a short extract. It's called Christmas at the Rum Jungle Hotel, and it's set in Northern Australia. Rum Jungle Town Centre consists of about four features, a telephone booth, a grocery store, an enormous gum tree, and what looked to me like the world's biggest pub the Rum Jungle Hotel. The foyer was decorated with a tired and limp garland and a Christmas tree which was long past its sell-by date. Now, I'd perhaps better tell you that the term 
hotel is probably a crime against advertising standards. It did in fact have rooms, but its main business was beer. As I was checking in, however, I noticed something in its favour, a collection of second-hand paperbacks for guests to borrow. I was riffling through them when the receptionist, a young woman, asked if I was looking for anything in particular. Ah, oh, I don't know. Anything, adventure, foreign travel, stuff like that. One book in particular looked appealing. Heart of Darkness. I picked it up and was scanning it when the receptionist said, I don't think that's quite what you think it is. Why not? Well, the guy who left it here said, and she looked around before whispering quietly, it's all about a bloke who takes a steamer up the Congo, if you know what I mean. Nevertheless, I took it as a Christmas present to myself and the key to a room that looked and felt as though it had been made of a combination of wood chip and asbestos fibre. I showered and lay on the bed with my book and, as is my habit, turned to the last page to see how things panned out. It didn't look too much like fun, as the words that leapt out at me were, the horror, the horror. Nevertheless, I leafed back to the beginning, but somehow only managed a couple of pages before I dozed off. I woke about half an hour later and went in search of food. I guess you've heard of Phil Spector's famous wall of sound. Well, entering the bar, the effect was like someone had turned up all the faders to get full saturation. It took a couple of moments to recover from the noise and for my eyes to adjust. The place was heaving with what must have been over a hundred blokes, all wearing blue shorts and stained singlets, chugging down beers as though there was no tomorrow, which, judging by their alcohol intake, might have been a wise precaution. The Christmas counter tea was in full swing. Of course, there was no turkey, so I opted for the barramundi, which hereafter I'll refer to as the hot water bottle fish, so named because it was deep fried with about an inch of batter on its outside, covering an object that looked like a fillet of fish, but which had the taste and consistency of rubber. I was just wondering if what I was eating was injurious to health, when the waitress rolled up. Aren't you eating that? I smiled in a way that was meant to say, maybe, as I didn't want to hurt her feelings. I needn't have bothered because she barked, well, get a flaming shift on you, mongrel. There's plenty of folks waiting for your plate. I didn't finish the fish. I might have done had I had a Geiger counter, but the more I looked at it, the more worried I became. Eventually, I stood up, walked towards a serving hatch and levered the remains into a large plastic dustbin, which was almost overflowing with uneaten food. As my fish slipped off my plate, I remember feeling thankful that that was one meal I'd never see again. Unfortunately, however, I was mistaken. There. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for um, sticking to that that time slot being brief, but not curt. Sorry. Um, anyway, uh, more terrible puns where that came from coming up, maybe. Um, OK, thank you. We now can move to um, Suzanne Parrick, if you're ready to go. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Hi there. Um, I was inspired by Anne's reading last week, so I've dredged up some memories from when I lived in Hong Kong. The sun was rising and backlit the lion rock ahead. I was glad of the fierce aircon in my car, which shielded me from the searing temperature outside. Hong Kong smelled different in the summer. The insidious pollution was ever present, but by June, hot weather combined with 99% humidity 
brought a distinctive penetrating clamminess. We fought a constant battle against the trespassing damp. Every home buzzed to the tune of a moisture sucking electric dehumidifier and every drawer contained the sachets of desiccant. This carried on from March until October until damp was banished by a change in season. It crept back into its cave while windows opened and closed dried in the open air once more. I headed through Chartin, already busy with morning rush hour traffic and kept going north. My destination, China. However, to get there, I first had to leave my car in an unassuming car park attached to a shopping center in Shengshui. Then I would get the train two stops to the border at Lo Wu. I had spent the previous few years learning to navigate the territory. This was a time before sat-navs made it all so easy. I could get around by foot, bus, ferry and metro. Now I was becoming an expert in my car. My forte was car parks. The reason was not some esoteric thirst for knowledge. I wasn't a car park spotter. No, I was scared. Hong Kong was full of one-way streets, dead ends and traffic. If you missed your turning, you could be spat out several miles from where you wanted to be. The drivers were unforgiving. You had to make rapid decisions and stick to them. No time to hesitate, or you could be sure a taxi would sound its klaxon. So I taught myself how to navigate every street and car park on Hong Kong Island. I was less confident in Kowloon and the new territories, but here I was heading north. I just needed to follow the signs and nearly missed it, the Lucky Coin shopping plaza. A few minutes later, I was on the platform, empty wheeled suitcase at my feet and can of iced coffee in hand, sweat snaking its way down my back. 32 degrees, the station LCD display confirmed. At the border, I queued to leave Hong Kong and then queued again to enter China. At the time, post handover, British citizens needed a visa to enter China, even just for a few hours. I'd had to apply and get mine earlier in the week. I tried not to glower at the lucky Americans sailing through as border guards barely glanced at their documents. The next year, in a game of passport ping pong, it would be the Americans who needed visas and we British could smugly enter the country visa free. Some three hours after leaving home, I shivered as I entered the generously air conditioned Shenzhen shopping mall. I went straight to the Golden Taylor Super Company. Hello, hello, the lady greeted me. I showed her my chit. Yes, already, she said, but I have to get from other place. You come back in one hour. Her shop was tiny with no room to store goods to be collected. So I headed off to browse the stores. The place was overwhelming. Whatever you needed or even what you didn't could be bought there. Any item of clothing or furnishing for your home, faithfully copied from pictures for a fraction of the price in Hong Kong, let alone London. I found myself on the top floor of the mall. Here, hairdressers and nail technicians vied for business. Their charges display prominently in Chinese script and English. There was a heady aroma of acetone and ammonia. Someone had told me it was worth getting a foot massage. So with another half an hour to wait, I sat in a well-stuffed pleather armchair while a wiry man in blue pajamas and canvas pumps crouched before me on a tiny stool and removed my sandals. He pressed his bony fingers into my instep. Ouch, I squealed, pulling my foot away. He jabbered something unintelligible and pulled my foot back towards him. He poked again, gentler this time. He shook his head. Bad, very bad. That's the end. <laughs> You're muted, Tom. Uh, that was my best stuff all night and you've missed it, I'm afraid. I'd say thank you very much, Suzanne. I love the line, the trespassing damp. Very, very evocative little uh, description, I thought. Thank you. Um, is it David Hyam or Higgum? I'm sorry if I've got that wrong. No, you got it absolutely right. It's Hyam. You're not the literary agent, David Hyam. Uh, sadly, no. Right, because I just, I know that <laughs> name from... Yeah, and you'd have no connection to Highgate and Hampstead. That was the other thing I thought when I saw you. Uh, no, no, none at all. Um, okay. 
the only connection I have with David Hyam Associates was a fee from a magazine for an article I did got sent to them instead instead of me. Oh right, oh that's <laughs> right. easily done though, I suppose. Yeah. But go ahead, David. Right, this is the opening four paragraphs of a travel piece. South Park Street Cemetery, Calcutta. South Park Cemetery in Calcutta is an English cemetery, and I could see plenty of those at home. I almost didn't bother to go. I'm glad I did, or I would have missed seeing the splendid tomb of Major General Charles Stewart, better known as Hindu Stewart. South Park Street has been renamed. The pink stone entrance now leads off raucous Mother Teresa Street. It's the street that's raucous, not the nun into a quiet and dilapidated graveyard romantically overrun by fig and palm trees. It looks and feels nothing like an English cemetery. It's oriental and exotic. The cemetery was opened in 1767 and fell out of use by 1790. The English people buried here belonged not to the Raj, but to the early years of the East India Company. They preceded the Victorians and their memorials are more in sympathy with Mughal and Hindu cultures than with Imperial Britain. The monuments are huge compared with English gravestones, and I couldn't place the style. There were miniature Greek temples, columns, arches, obelisks, domes and cupolas. Some of the obelisks were pyramid shaped, others conical and carved in spirals. It didn't feel the least bit Christian. I should have thought myself in a Mughal burial ground. I learnt later the tombs are a mixture of Gothic and Indo-Saracenic style. Some of the carvings show a Hindu influence. It was a strange and wonderful place of calm, surrounded by the hectic rush of modern Kolkata. Indeed, the cemetery is only a remnant of a much larger plot that has been built over. Taxis, buses and bicycles now stream over the forgotten remains of the men and women of the East India Company. I walked round this marvel reading the inscriptions. The people here died young. Many of the men died in their 40s. There were enormous monuments to young women. A huge pyramid shaped obelisk marks the grave of Elizabeth Barwell, who died in 1778, aged 23. Rose Aylmer lies dead at 20 under a vast inverted ice cream cone of a tomb. It was said that the life expectancy of a European in Kolkata in the 18th century was two monsoons. Many of the young women had died in childbirth and the men, if not of disease, in war or accident. The people buried here were not faint hearted. Thank you so much, David. Another very evocative piece. Um, reminds me of when I was in Calcutta about 14 years ago, and I'm still not sure if I've recovered even now from the experience in, in, a, in a good way. Um, just a sort of extraordinary uh, assault on the senses, isn't it? As I... It's a wonderful, wonderful. I, I spent uh, just wandering around getting lost. It was truly wonderful. More Love book it. shops than any other city per capita or something as well, which is always a good sign, I think. Yeah. I read. Brilliant. Okay. Um, we will now go to Habib, if you would like to read something for us. Sorry, guys, but uh, I'm just going to quickly close the door because the, the kids are uh, actually shouting. No so problem. No problem. <laughs> Of you can even hear the Hoover as well, can't you? <laughs> but I promise it is a very short piece. Um, it's my first of anything of this kind I've been uh, working on uh, since the first lockdown. Um, so it's the very short chapter of, the, uh, of my new book, The Whisper of the Erico. Just gonna find it. Okay. In a world no different from our own, where strange creatures called home, from ghouls to goblins, demons and dragons. Sea monsters and serpents dominated the seas. What was left of the land were forests, moss and remnants of old cities. The world once ruled by giants, though the few that remain carry an unknown burden and pain. Now governed by three leaders of three different kinds, one of them wise, the other two blind. 
In the West, the ogre king, cold and callous, quote, grotesque in nature, grotesque in sight. The mystery remained of how he retained his throne without a fight. In the East, the griffin queen, gracious, beautiful, and kind. Her compassion, captivating all creatures, capturing hearts and minds. And the Earl King, pitiful and plump, pretentious governor of fairy folk across the middle. A question of how he stayed in power was yet another riddle. Feridum had a variety of, well, sorry, Feridum had variety and small islands aplenty, big enough for elves, imps, and all sorts of fairies, surrounded by old but dead technology, riddled with rectangular blocks, once containing worlds of information now used for fairy folk stock as balls, roofs, and even decoration. The Elk King uh, lived in one island, nestled to, between two other, far from his only daughter, Amber, and her mother. Uh, that was the first chapter. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Abby, that was excellent, um, it, and it, a, a nice link back to the kind of more fantastical speculative fiction worlds that, that Dave and, and Wendy were talking about. That's great. Um, so we have, last but not least, um, of those who've signed up, David E. Gates. Like Hello. Him. Hi. Uh, this is a, a very much a bridge version um, of a chapter from my book Omenology, which is a collection of travel logs. Uh, and this is the chapter uh, Egypt with James. At the airport check-in, James joked with the staff at the desk saying two seats across the aisle from each other were perfect for our flight to Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt. A different row altogether would be better, he suggested. The lady behind the desk asked for my name. Gates, I offered. As in Bill Gates, she checked. Yes, I said, thanks for that. James laughed. He's just been sacked from Microsoft. It's why I need a holiday, I justified. We made our way to the gate once our flight was called. En route, James said he needed a PFD. What's a PFD, I asked. Pre-flight dump, he confirmed. We're told during the flight that the temperature in Egypt is 41 degrees. I like it hot, James tells me, quoting Peter Kay, but not that hot. We experienced some turbulence during the flight, but it's not too serious, and we touched down in Egypt on time. On arrival at the hotel, we dump our stuff and head to the restaurant in the resort to enjoy the buffet and a couple of beers. We check out the entertainment, consisting of locals singing and dancing rather badly, and see a massive guy in the Windsor bar. It's Mr. Creosote, James says. The next morning, James wakes me up by throwing a beach ball at my head. Outside, it's bright and sunny, which makes me think it's later than the 0515 it is. Good morning, I say. It's not a good morning for me, he replies. Why, what's up, I ask. You, you're snoring. Jesus, he says. I laugh, roll over, and go back to sleep, intermittently waking up as James bashes around the room. We spend our days between the beach and the pool, topping up our tans and failing miserably to get acquainted with the ladies. Most evenings we attend Soho Square, the main hub for entertainment with bars and restaurants lining the street. On the way there, we notice that a number of cars are driving without their headlamps on, despite it being dark. It seems to be perfectly acceptable, but James and I can think of no logical reason why that would be so. On the last night, we grab a nightcap from the bar before readying for bed. As I settle down, James gives me a portentous warning. When you snore, bad things will happen, he says ominously. When you snore, a puppy will die, he warns. I laugh and close my eyes and I'm soon asleep. The next morning, I'm woken by James screaming hysterically. I blearily open my eyes and as they become accustomed to the sunlight streaming through the windows, I look at him quizzically to ascertain what's wrong. Have you seen the news? He asked me, knowing I haven't. 500 puppies dead. Thanks so much, David. What a lovely comic note to uh, round ground that off with that's great that thank you um is would anyone else like to read something we we still have time um or we could i'm sure people have questions for for david and wendy which so we, we could just move to that i'm happy to be uh led by you on that 
well, I, I could read something, but I, I, I'm quite interested to have a few questions. And uh, me, me too, actually. Yeah. So, so, I, so we could always read something afterwards when we're if we're a few of us hanging around with a with a beer or wine or something. Yeah. Later. Okay, that sounds like a, a suggestion. I don't know. I know. I think that's a perfectly reasonable suggestion, Richard. Um, so, are there any questions for Wendy and Dave? I think everything they've said has been very thought-provoking, and I, yeah, I, well, I certainly have some, some things I'd like to ask them. But well, any, I, yeah, I do, I do. I do. I don't know if it's a question, but Wendy might want to respond. But I just, I was just recalling. I think one of the things you said, Wendy, was about when you're um, presenting uh, a, a fictional or, a, or a, a, whether it's a novel short story or whatever don't uh, a, a sort of warning not to bore the reader with too much detail just thinking you've got to tell them everything about the world you're in and I was recalling uh, a piece of text that I, I read that in a workshop I did with Mandy about um, the first page of uh, William Golding's Lord of the Flies and it's an, it's an extraordinary example of just giving information, there's a sort of dialogue going on with two boys, you know, who've just come to terms with the fact they crashed on this island. And you gradually, there's a slow, a slowish reveal of the scene, really, and the, and the, and the, and, and the text um, in the conversation they're having. And it also occurred to me that in some ways, with the characters you introduce, they may not always, always know the world they're in they it may be strange to them and that the slow reveal is somewhere but if you've got anything to say about that to add to what you already said before i'd be happy to hear it i just realized yeah. that i'm not a fi yeah. i'm not a prose writer in particular yeah. But. yeah two points i think from that one of them you've mentioned the fact that um, information can be got over in dialogue and that's a very good way to do it actually and you can link that with another idea that I mentioned, the idea of the innocent abroad, the character who doesn't know where he or she is, so they're completely out of place. So if you get them into a conversation with somebody who does know about the place that they're in, you can get a great, quite a lot of information with one character asking questions and the other one answering them. So that avoid the straightforward info dump and you can get you know you've got character interaction there i think that's a good way to do it very often yeah thanks great thanks Richard. i'll just before we go to any other questions i'll just um mention that the, the davids have kindly provided links to websites where you can read more of their work um and and so i i just um mention that there's uh, David Hyam so it's www.theancienttraveller.com um read from uh, uh david e and then for stroke omenology omenology um so so do check that out and there are links further back to uh, Wendy's and David's work as well any other questions for for our main speakers yeah yeah, I, I wanted to ask David. Um, I wondered what he used to create all his his um, his worlds. <laughs> so he got some software he'd recommend for 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 creating all these different planets and things. Well, I'd, I'd like to find the software because they're actually handmade. Um, mm -hmm. Now um, they can be converted school globes. Um, Lower Cretaceous Earth, however, was polystyrene. Uh, covered with um, oh, sellotape, you know, or whatever, taped completely round because the car body, the fiberglass I put on, it was the first time I was doing this for the oceans, um, ate away polystyrene. Um, so I had to embalm the, the whole lot in resin proof tape. The one of the Royal Geographical Society was. Um, a huge fiberglass globe composed of two uh, hemispheres. So you can you can build a globe out of more than one thing, but uh, the bigger the globe is, the costlier it is, generally. Uh, yeah, how about the um, like like the picture that that, that you've got of the um, of the terraform Mars? How did you do right. that? Ah, now that was. Uh, that was 
polystyrene as 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 well, and um, yeah, that was polystyrene in, in in interior. Yeah, it just it just was very very lifelike. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I I love detail. You know, I, I love satellite imagery, and I try to re re reproduce that. And um, when I'm doing it, I think I must be mad to be doing this, uh, but. It really comes alive when you, when you start painting it. Yeah, mm. and the and the and the images you had where you'd photoshopped on the clouds and that. Where where you got the got the um, planets and and stuff from for that? Well, there again, I mean the the two uh, the um, now my world. That's the last one I did. That yeah. was a fiberglass globe. <laughs> Incidentally, the land masses are. Um, polyfiller um, so um, and then I have a model making technique that comes close to reproducing a detail of a satellite photo but the the exo earth one um, was one of the polystyrene globes with car body filler uh, over it again and uh, so that's that I guess. okay thanks that's right. interesting yeah I, I didn't yeah I, I didn't realize you'd physically built all of them. Yeah, that's, oh, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, no, I haven't used a computer for any of it, but yeah. Um, but I think uh, you, you can take them, photograph them, the images, yeah. and you've got that on computer and we'll, we'll work on that. Another thing I'd love to do, um, if there's some sort of app that, that comes up, would be um, working on this world, but putting the poles in completely different places. <laughs> And working out what world climate would, would be like then, you yeah. know, say if, if you have the equator um, at right angles to where it usually grows, running along the Greenwich uh, meridian. So we'd be in the uh, tropics and I worked out one of the poles is in the Bay of Bengal and the other is on the uh, uh, Galapagos Islands. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that, that would produce some pretty weird <laughs> effects. Very interesting. Yeah, brilliant, me. thanks. Any other questions for our guests? Mm -hmm. Wendy, I, I had one for you. Um, uh, and it's it kind of relates to, to Richard's question and, and your answer to it, I suppose. Um, some writers talk about how they create a character and flesh a character out. Um, and then a story sort of suggests itself from that act of creating a character. I wonder if, so it's partly a question about your sort of creative process and your writing process, whether you've created a world and you've really been very attentive to the details of it in the way that you, you talked about the, you know, the, the, the beginning and a story has kind of jumped out at you or suggested itself from just that, you know, that world that you've created and those conditions that you've created? I think it, this is always a difficult one, isn't it? Which comes first, character or, or world? I think probably the story comes first and the character comes first, I think, with me. But then it's a case of thinking of where they are and that's, that's when I start to flesh out world from that. So I think it's the other way around, really, with me. Right, yeah. Because I suppose if you create a world that has some sort of extreme um, sort of conditions to it, you know, a kind of I'm thinking of like a lot, lots of work of J.G. Ballard, which is usually I know Dave's a fellow fan. Um, I'm a huge, huge Ballard fan, um, and uh, you know his so did a sort of trilogy of the books in the kind of early to mid '60s, including the Drowned World and the Crystal World, and these imagined a kind of yeah a, a, a world gone horribly wrong due to um sort of climate change and and uh you know freak weather and so on um and i suppose if you've yeah if you create a world like that it's it's necessarily going to have impacts on the people who are trying to survive there so maybe a story emerges from that sort of conflict between the the characters and the place or um, something like that, but um, I don't know. Is that something that happens in your in your short? Well, 
I'm not, I must admit, I tend to steer away from the dystopia and the drowned world and stuff. Right. In fact, most of my work's usually the other way around. It's characters running away from destroyed worlds to absolutely unspoiled wild worlds. Right. And the, the story usually is actually defending that other world from other people who want to come in and destroy it very often. It's okay. something nasty like mining it or raiding the other resources or something. So that's what often drives my story. Okay, interesting. Um, Chris is saying he has a very short piece written since Wendy and David finished, if there's time. Um, well, we could we could shift back to some more performances if everyone if anyone else has a question or a comment they want to make. Um, just one last one. Um, no, in that case, go ahead, Chris. Why not? Yeah, if you want to read your piece that you've done, that'd be great. Before Richard. Oh, I don't. Uh... Yeah, please do, Chris. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, if you're sure. Thank you. Yeah, go. Give it a little go. It's, as I say, this was written uh, after the end of Wendy and David's section. So it's. There's all sorts of arrows and go back to this bit in the star here and so it might sound a little bit disjointed. <laughs> I'll give it a little go. Here we go. <clears throat> so there I am, near the end of my shift in the Mandela Valley in the southern Martian hemisphere. I've been fixing an armature on an autonomous mineral testing rover and my comms start you know, pink surfing. Hey guys, Houston, are you reading my stats okay? There was a quarter of a second delay before Jim in Houston replies. Hi Norm, yep, your stats are within parameters. Well, the quantum microspeaker rang slightly, but at least I didn't have to wait the 11 minutes. I would have had to wait only two or three years ago. But then my right hand valga starts blinking out of sync. Oh, Jim, can you see this? This sidebod, the sidebod needs, it needs sorting quickly. I've got, a, I've only got half an hour left in bod before I've got to get back to Woking for my son's seventh birthday. Finis, that's it. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Very good, very funny. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> good work. Um, so Richard, did you, did you want to, Read something more. Yeah, I'm cheating really because people may have heard this, but it uh, already. And uh, I, I normally write poetry, so if it was a poetry night, this would be a poem. But as it's more prose, it's not. It's prose. So um, uh, uh, I, if I can find it, sorry, it caught me out there a bit. I, I could. This is quite quick, but I, I could read other stuff. But I, I just thought it was appropriate in the sense that. Sorry, let me find it first because I might have to read something else. Okay. Um, yeah, it occurred to me that when I travel, it is about travel, but it's also something uh, 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 surreal about this because often when I travel, I, I like to go to exotic places because they take me out of my normal reality. And um, being a, a film fan, I suppose it's also uh, literature as well, but being Two of my favourite films are, of science fiction are uh, Blade Runner and there are, I had this in mind when I was actually in this place, I suppose, uh, and it reminded me of it, but also references to the sequel to one of my all time favourite films, Wong Kar Wai's In the Mood for Love, that takes place in uh, Hong Kong in perhaps the 50s or 60s, and the sequel to it, which is Room which is called 2046, which has, um, um, it, it involves a writer who's writing science fiction, so it has science fiction elements to it. So to me, this piece comes together in that when I was walking around the, uh, the, the bright lights of um, Manila in McCarty, um, I, I just love to imagine that I'm in a surreal place and, and, and with the with the with the with the um, aids of a little bit of alcohol in, in, um, 
I, I can imagine that I'm not really in this world. And it's really like a little adventure and a certain touch of danger, perhaps, you know, in, in placing myself in situations where I don't really know what's going on. Um, yeah, sorry, taking a long time to introduce it, but it is a short piece anyway. <laughs> um, I have I have read it before, but um, so yeah, you might pick up a few references, perhaps. Shape shifting. One last red horse beer in a McCarty bar on P. Burgos Street, the unexpected offer of a large shot of 80 proof tanned away dark, perhaps should have been declined. 60s saturated Eastman color scene, sudden downpour, lurid pinks and blues of bar illuminations ripple in the spears of rain. Backstreet, walk past the ziggurat exotic restaurant, look for replicants in dark doorways, constantly flicking lustrous black hair, scanning for eye contact with luckless prospects. On Durban Street, nothing is what it seems. The Sunet Tower receptionist hands me my key. Lift doors, swish, open, close, open, close. Key in the door, room 2046, fade to black. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. Cheers. Right. Um, I suppose we ought to wrap this up really formally at least. Um, but I think if a number of us are gonna stay on and, and have a, a glass of wine, or in my case, um a what is this? Alcoholic seltzer with low calories. Um, I'm just trying not to, you know lockdown trying to be a bit healthier than usual um it does actually taste not too bad but um so you're all welcome to um hang out afterwards do the equivalent of going to the pub if this was or going to the bar if we if we were able to um do this event in uh, what the kids call meat space i believe the real world um but it, it um but anyway let me just thank our special guest speakers first of all uh, david Angus and Wendy Metcalf, who've just done a, a tremendous job. Um, like I say, I promised you it would be unique, and I think that was unique as these things go, certainly. Um, thank you to my colleagues, Mandy, Richard, and Vin for helping out and contributing, and for um, well, especially to Mandy, who really sort of organized this and came up with a, I think, a really effective structure, um, giving people an opportunity to, do, to share their work as well as these slots for Wendy and David to. to to, uh, talk to us so and thank you to everyone who performed um and attended it's great um to see you and um nice to see these kind of themes developing between um not just genres science fiction and travel writing seem to be the main literary genres discussed but um you know cultures and places were kind of mentioned and built on and linked together through people's readings so i think i'm, I'm always looking i think as writers we're always looking for patterns and there were lots of really intriguing patterns between people's works tonight i thought so um yeah, tom i'd like just yeah. to add my thanks to you for for oh. keeping it all together and also i mean to, to to dave and wendy i thought it was a fascinating evening with, with great contrast, I really enjoyed that in the presentation and how yeah. that, it actually actually worked and didn't <laughs> crash, which is which yeah. brilliant. Thanks, Mandy, for all that organising. But thanks to you too. But I also just want to say not not only the the yeah the guests here and people I've maybe seen once or twice before, but the contributions that everybody else brought were extraordinary. I think they're brilliant. I was yeah. just in, entertained all the way through. Thank you very much to everyone. Thanks. Cheers then. <laughs> and I, I'm hanging around for a bit. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I'm always knackered by this time in the evening, so I'm probably going to leave you. So have fun. Cheers, Wendy. Thank you so much, Wendy. Yeah, yeah. you're great. And, and, uh, bye. 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 Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. And, and I, with a few of us left, we could have come off mute, couldn't we? If we could just. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
and I'm, going to, I'm going to stop recording at this point as well. That was a good idea, yeah. <laughs>